Uh, I'll just check that this works to start with. Yeah. So the theme of collaboration and the need for individual disciplines to break down historical barriers is, I believe, a defining issue for the provision of healthcare in the future around the world. If we're going to be able to deliver true medical innovation to patients with unmet or intractable medical conditions, and to do that in a predictable and cost-effective manner, then all the disciplines that are involved in this vital and worthy endeavor are going to have to find better ways to work together. Uh, that includes, obviously, the industry, to which I belong, have done for many years, but also the regulators, the prescribers, the patients, the payers, academics, public and private enterprises, everybody. Now, clearly, trying to get such collaboration is a challenge. If it had been easy, we would have done it a long time ago. But I do think that personalized medicines provide an impetus now to pull all these different disciplines together. And by personalized medicine, what I'm really talking about are medicines that can be specifically targeted to subpopulations of patients on the basis of their genotypic or metabolic uh, molecular prof uh, profiles. And uh, this is a theme that I think we're going to talk about more during the course of the, the morning. The question, of course, is why personalized medicines should provide such a forcing function. Why is it that suddenly uh, something like this enables everybody to start collaborating? And I think in order to understand this better, we should probably start where we always do with the science. So scientific discovery is an agent of change. It always has been, it always will be. Uh, no more so than in the diagnosis of disease. So here is a good example. Many years ago, Breast cancer was diagnosed on the basis of the location of the tumor, quite simply. It can now be much better classified, much better classified, according to the genotypic features and the resulting molecular pathology that the patient has. And using that classification, you can turn up with at least 10 different types of breast cancer, each of which may be susceptible to different therapeutic interventions. I'm sure many of you remember at the late 1990s the introduction of a drug called Herceptin, which in some ways people think of as the first personalized medicine. Herceptin was uniquely sensitive to tumor cells that overexpressed a certain protein called HER2. Uh, about 15, 20% of breast cancers do that. Herceptin was extremely effective in those breast cancers, not <coughs> effective in others. And research like this, I think, is going to have a very important effect on the practice of medicine in the future. Gone are the days where we will classify disease by symptoms. It's now increasingly possible to subtype common diseases on the basis of specific and measurable biological markers and then use those biological markers for diagnosis. So that's fantastic. We're evolving to a more sophisticated form of classification, more sensitive to the diseases that we work with, but what's the consequence of this? Why does that actually matter? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Firstly, as diseases fragment, their precise molecular identities will allow for rational, targeted therapies designed to interfere with the specific biological processes in really very tightly defined patient groups. That's what we really mean by personalized medicine. And there are many therapies, monoclonal antibodies, viral vectors, uh, immunomodulators, things that we have now that are very good at doing that. Secondly, biomarkers, and by that I mean indicators of biological, normal biological or pathogenic processes, biomarkers are going to be used not just for diagnosis, but also for prognosis and for determining therapeutic decision-making. And what that will do, I think, is increase not just the predictability of response, but it will also potentially reduce unnecessary risk. Clearly, if you're not introducing low-efficacy drugs to patient populations, then you're not introducing any risk to them either, and that's important. And the third thing, and Hugh mentioned something of this as well, is the importance of patient data. 
Um, it's going to be true that genotypic data is much more important in the future because it helps us with the specificity of diagnosis, but not just that data, also real-world data, data gathered through real-world experience that allow us better to monitor the outcomes of standard clinical practice. Now, all of this is very positive. It's positive for patients, it's positive for society at large. But as a result, I think we're going to have to address some of the traditional ways in which we discover, develop, and regulate new medicines. So the issue I think we face here, or at least one of them, is that the processes and the frameworks through which traditionally we have brought medicines to patients are no longer keeping pace with the scientific progress that I have just outlined. So as an example, our current regulatory framework is very rigid. It is not easily adaptable to the new personalized medicine approach. Approach which, which, which requires smaller patient numbers, modified data requirements, and differential assessments of risk. It's about regulation, but it's not just about regulation. So clinical trials, expensive and quite inflexible, often looking for small effect sizes in very large, broadly defined populations. We need new adaptive trial designs which can enable faster decision-making from fewer data in smaller, better-defined patient groups. What about health technology assessment? Well, also, I think, increasingly ill-equipped to quantify value in these smaller, more tightly defined patient groups. And this, of course, is now hugely important because, arguably, health technology assessment and reimbursement is the gatekeeper of patient access. No longer is it uh, marketing approval. So, what's vital is for us to recognize that all of these elements, not just regulation or reimbursement or clinical trial design, but all of them and others besides, need to be addressed collectively if we are going to make any progress in this area, any progress in support of future patient needs. Now, perhaps to understand this better, <coughs> we can look back at what is the traditional process of drug discovery and development. And I've shown you a chart. I'm sure you've seen something like this many times before. Uh, this is the traditional sort of serial approach to discovery and development. It's time-consuming. You can look along the bottom and see how many years it takes, 14-plus years, certainly. Uh, it's expensive. Estimates vary uh, widely, but certainly more than a billion dollars per drug once you've accounted for failures. And it's hugely inefficient. The attrition rate, as you can see, is uh, extreme. In fact, it's no longer really fit for purpose. Now, by the way, I should make a point here that this says Europe at the top, and that's because of the audience today, <clears throat> this is not intended to be a European-specific issue. Far from it. It's a global issue. Essentially, each stage of this process awaits data from the previous stage before you can make a decision. And these days, health technology assessment and national reimbursement decisions add a number of years onto the back end of an already long process, which means that it's even longer before you can actually make a new drug available to patients. So put simply, we need a fundamental redesign of this pathway. It's no longer reasonable, <clears throat> certainly isn't sustainable, for us to take 14 or 15 years and billions of dollars to bring new drugs to the market, particularly if many of those new drugs are of marginal efficacy, and then through health technology assessment, we decide that actually they're not valuable anyway and we don't deliver them to patients. This is not something that we can sustain. Now, in case you need any uh, further evidence of the problem, uh, this rather depressing chart is typical. Again, you may have seen it of the decade-long decline that goes on in what we refer to as R&D productivity. It's actually the, <coughs> the number of uh, new medicines made available per billion dollars of R&D spend, and it's a depressing picture. It's depressing not just for the industry, but it's depressing for society as a whole. So the question is, what are we going to do about this? And more importantly, what are we going to do together about this? Well, we need to react, certainly. <clears throat> we need to adapt, not just the development pathway, but the regulatory pathway and the reimbursement pathway as well. We need to change these frameworks so that we put patient needs first and we incentivize real innovation. So, for example... 
Clinical trial regulation in Europe has long been considered bureaucratic and inconsistent, and in fact the Clinical Trial Directive of 2004 made that worse, something which slowly we're starting to address now through legislation. Trial designs are very poorly adapted to uh, the needs of personal medicines, they really are, and the data requirements that agencies have are stuck in sort of randomized cl uh, controlled clinical trial space. Uh, agencies really are not receptive to many new trial designs. So there's a problem. Problem as well with uptake of innovation. All across Europe, uptake of innovation, new medicines, is very slow. There are some countries that have been inundated by that issue. I live in the UK. That's one country that, that has a real problem, but other countries are having the same issue. And the, the reason here is that European market authorization is no longer the defining step in the process of bringing a medicine to a patient. It's now nationally agreed reimbursement that is the, the critical event. And so if that stage is delayed, then delivering medicines to patients is delayed as well. And that's why the quantification of value, which the health technologists are in charge of, is, I think, also suboptimal, because it fails really to reflect the total uh, benefit of a new drug. It's, it's much more directed towards somewhat simplistic cost thresholds. Okay, a lot needs to change. Um, as I've emphasized before, I think all these things need to change together. All the disciplines among all the stakeholders have to move as one if we're going to make any significant difference to this environment. Now, <clears throat> there's some good news. So, we always need good news. I don't want to stand here being overtly pessimistic. The good news, as far as I see it, is that for the first time in my experience, all of the stakeholders engaged in this very broad debate are aligned on the need for fundamental change. Their motivations, of course, may be different. Um, but the consequence is, I hope, that we will get multidisciplinary collaboration uh, as a reality. So if you look at all the stakeholders here, I mean, patients and carers clearly want access to new medicines as fast as possible. Regulators want, I think, I hope, a more flexible evaluation framework uh, that increases predictability, reduces inefficiency and hopefully stimulates innovation, but they don't understandably want to compromise patient safety, nor should they. It's a tall order, but hopefully we can do it. Payers want earlier engagement in the discussion. They want to help shape the data needs in the development pathway that will allow a better assessment of value. Industry wants increased R&D productivity, clearly. It also wants proper incentives for innovation. And society at large, I think, will benefit hugely if we can ensure that genuine scientific breakthroughs are translated into patient benefits as quickly as possible. How are we doing? Well, I think we're making some progress. Um, in regulatory terms, there are some quotes here from the EMA's recent press release which followed their board meeting in March where they were talking about their 2013 work program. Um, I won't go through all these but you can see references to innovative study designs, iterative phases of evaluation aligning with patient needs and also down here at the bottom um, <clears throat> the idea that you're going to use real world data and essentially get the views of patients on the acceptable levels of risk. All these things are directionally positive. Uh, in fact, Guido Rassi actually made the point, and I quote, that regulation today is characterized by the increasing complexity of applications for new medicines. And he referenced personalized medicines in that statement. I think this all demonstrates that the EMA certainly is changing its stance and looking for more collaboration, which is good. Again, this is not an issue just for Europe. Uh, only last week, Janet Woodcock, who is the director of CEDA, Center for Drug Evaluation at the FDA, um, uh, made a, a, a speech. Uh, I would have had it here had it uh, happened a few weeks earlier. But she said that the FDA would need to turn the clinical trial paradigm on its head 
in order to allow more specifically targeted, personalized drug therapies to get to the market faster. So she clearly believes that targeted therapies have reached the mainstream. And she quoted some data saying that now more than a third of all approved new medical entities last year had genomic biomarker information in their submission. That is a big move forwards. Outside specific regulation, what else is happening? Well, increasing numbers of collaborative groups with deep academic roots who have an interest in the topic of adapting the development and regulatory pathways, better serving patient needs, and stimulating innovation. And I've got a couple of examples up here. <clears throat> the first, NewDigs, which is, uh, stands for New Drug Development Paradigms, is a US-based um, collaboration through MIT. Spent a lot of time thinking about adaptive licensing and demonstrating through real-world simulation that you can actually take time off the development uh, timeline, significant time, if you look at adaptive licensing approaches. The one below, CASME, is a, a more recent collaboration between the University of Oxford and University College London. It's actually run by Richard Barker, a former director general of the ABPI. And this has a mission to develop new testable models of medical innovation. Now, there are more and more of these groups forming, which again, I think, shows that the barriers between different disciplines are starting to erode and that will be to the benefit of everybody. But I think most importantly, certainly for me, is that industrial research, industrial research is also becoming multidisciplinary. As companies, however big they are, understand, firstly, that they can no longer navigate this environment alone. It's not possible. Collaboration with other companies, collaboration with academia, and with public institutions has now become a core competency within this industry. That was never the case even 10 years ago. Companies also realize that new technologies, and by that I'm referring to omic technologies, genomics, proteomics, that kind of thing, have become fundamental to their success. And that those technologies need to be properly integrated, both into the drug development process, but also into regulatory approval, and indeed into clinical practice. Genomics in particular seems to lie at the heart of a lot of this, both in terms of the development of biomarkers and diagnostics, but also with respect to targeted personalized therapies. And I think many companies you now see are pursuing this actively. In fact, the logo at the bottom here uh, reflects Amgen, my company's own interest in this space. Um, you may, some of you know that at the end of last year, we acquired a company in Iceland called Decode Genetics, uh, which is a leader in analyzing the human genome and assessing risk, uh, genetic risk factors for disease. Uh, we are not alone in this interest. More and more companies understand that the genetic basis of disease is going to be a key feature of the future. Okay, so there's tangible progress on all sides. That's good. I hope I have encouraged you to think positively about this. The question then is what more can we do and what more can we do collectively to address the needs of patients and support the development of and access to personalized medicine in the future? So let me give you a few suggestions to conclude, things that I think we need to think seriously about. Firstly, Enhancing academic industrial collaboration. There is still wariness on both sides between the industry and academia. Wariness of engagement, which we need to address directly. We cannot work in silos. We have to work together. Hugh made the point about electronic health records earlier on. I think we need to invest enormously in electronic health records, in biobanks, in genetic databases, and in the linkages between all of those things. Because unless we can get better access to real-world data, and that comes from many places, we will not be able to improve long-term health outcomes for patients. So that is absolutely key. Of course, we need to promote flexible regulatory evaluation frameworks. We need to have a coherent health technological view of value and a broader assessment of value. It's too narrow at the moment. And we need to think about flexible pricing schemes. The economic model for personalized medicines is very different from the economic model of conventional medicines. We need to be advocates, I think, for the proper integration 
of companion diagnostics, both in terms of their approval and their reimbursement. Personalized medicine will rely heavily on diagnostics. So we need to support that. And as I've said, I think we need to adopt innovative clinical trial designs and ensure that adaptive licensing methodologies are also supported by the agencies with whom we work. All of that's key. But let me come back finally to the point that Hugh was talking about, which is public-private partnerships. I think we need to support public-private partnerships like IMI, which, despite some initial skepticism, I believe, has provided a very successful pre-competitive environment for multi-stakeholder engagement across a wide variety of issues. It is my hope, it should be our hope, that IMI2, which is the proposed public-private partnership within the next framework program, Horizon 2020, that IMI2 will provide the neutral platform that allows all the various disciplines to work together and ensure that we can not just collaborate but revise the research, discovery, development, regulatory and reimbursement frameworks, all of which is going to be necessary if we want to bring better personalized medicines more quickly to the patients who need them. I sincerely believe that you will hear much more about this area of work, this multidisciplinary collaboration as it applies to drug development over the coming months and years. I sincerely hope that it will be within the context of a public-private partnership like IMI2. And I am of the opinion that all of you who can influence that should and will ensure that this kind of approach is at the front and center of what we do when it comes to collaboration across the disciplines for the worthy endeavor of bringing new medicines to patients. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. I am interested, as always, as much in your comments as I am in any questions which I will endeavor to answer. Thank you.